you can do anything in a novel. But one of the th things you can't do is explain. You can't explain, particularly things like, you know, the credit crunch is complicated and technical and involves a lot of, um, you know, maths and all that stuff. You just can't have characters doing that. And, you know, as when Nigel looked towards, you know, as Nigel looked towards the Canary Wharf, he struggled to remember the definition of a collateralised debt obligation. And let the reader out cold and is, is woken by the milkman. Uh, and it was very useful from the point of view of keeping a sort of distinction between the things that were specific to the credit crunch, which needed to be explained non-fictionally, and the things that about London and about cities and about our attitudes to money that are kind of always true. And it was something that I learned a useful distinction between fiction dwelling on things that are kind of always and generally true and the specifics of what went wrong this time. So I started writing it thinking that there was going to be a bust of some sort. This is late 2005, early 2006, and it just seemed obvious that we were at that point of, you know, what goes up must come down. Partly because I remember it happened before, it happened in the late 80s. Um, and, the, and there was something very odd about the fact that it's as if the whole culture had forgotten. You know, there was a house crash in 1987. It wasn't in 1787. It was just it was 20 years before, but everyone had... It was as if there was this collective amnesia. And I was very interested by that, that, that you know, we seem to have forgotten that thing about, you know, you have these boom-bust cycles. So I started writing it thinking there was going to be a bust, and then got very interested. And, and so it's a classic, the book began with a dramatic irony, that the reader would know something that the characters don't. I mean, a classic dramatic irony is, is the audience knows something that the actors don't. And it, it was one of those, that the, the reader would know that there was going to be a, a bust coming, but the characters don't. Um, and then the crash happened, and of course it was much bigger, much scarier, much more systemic than, than anyone had thought possible. Um, and so when I, f I still, so I had my dramatic irony in spades. Um, and then when I finished a draft of the book, I got very interested in the real world stuff, the things that actually happened. And so I always put a novel aside for a bit before going back to finish it. And I thought, no, what I'll do this time um, is one, I'm, you know, just clearing my head to go back and finish the novel. I'll, I'll write a non-fiction account of, of the real world thing. A really striking thing about, about Britain uh, is how much it's changed in the last 30, 40 years. It really, you've had the equivalent of the kind of change that countries have after revolutions or civil wars or, or wars, except we haven't had one. We've just had this convulsive social and economic change. And, and, you, and the thing that particularly interests me is that you know, I was visiting someone I know in Sussex a couple of months ago and they were talking about the fact that, you know, the land looks the same, the houses look the same, but actually everything that goes on there has changed. You know, the people who live in those houses are hedge funders who commute from London and stay in town three days a week. And that land that once employed thousands of people working on it would now have, you know, a thousandth as much labour because the machines are so much more productive. And the, lands, the landscape is empty. And, you know, the different kinds of people live in the villages and the houses are worth millions of quid that were, you know, once built as labourers' cottages. And all that. So you've had this thing of a kind of complete overturning of what's going on behind the scenes, but the stage set looks the same. And I was really interested by that, by the idea that you have a street, you know, it's still the same street it was when it was built in, in the late 1870s. But actually everything about it, in terms of who lives there, what they do, what the relations between them are, uh, has has completely changed, and th so th th I like the idea of a street as a sort of focus for for the novel because you can get so much of that um, that diversity and variety and and change, you know, beneath the surface that looks the same as it always has. You know, the UK is a big and complicated place, and I think um, I wouldn't presume to try and you know sum it up. I'm not sure one can sum up a whole country like that. But I did think of it as being in some sense about, um, I was trying to write about things that caught my attention in London. Um, uh, that's not quite the same as being representative though, because you, if you think of it as being representative, you immediately start thinking about characters that you have to have in. It's almost like choosing union delegates or UN delegates, you know, you have to represent that, to represent that. And that's a trap, I think, uh, for any kind of work of fiction.
Um, but I, I did want to have, I suppose that it's simplest to you know, write about some of the things I saw looking out the window. You know, I don't know whether it's a London thing, a big city thing, a British thing, or a thing about m modernity in general. Um, and I've had very different responses to people who live in different places about it, you know, whether they recognise this or not. But the thing I really notice about London life is how little we have in common, how little people know their neighbours. And politicians are always talking about, you know, community this, community that. And my experience of, of London life has been that community in that sense simply doesn't exist. You know, people who happen to live in an area being in it together just because they live in houses next to each other d doesn't exist. I think people have work communities, family communities, they have communities of interest and affiliations, they have communities through, um, through, through internet things, I think, increasingly. Um, but that thing, a community being just your, the people who happen to live next door to you, in my experience, just isn't, isn't real anymore. And so I was very interested by that thing of what they have in common, the people who live in the street. And the idea that got me started thinking about those cars was that one of the things they have in common is the fact that people envy them. You know, people would like the idea of living in that street. The houses are worth millions of quid. Um, people just want that life. They want what they have. And so that the sort of thread that runs through that is this thing about the, the underlying things about the fragility of our connections with each other um, and the fact that people have these parallel private lives that barely touch um, and I wanted that to be true in the novel just as it seems to me to be true in real life that increasingly in modern life you have these sort of lives lived side by side that just have the faintest of contact with each other and in the novel, the, the contact they have with each other is through, through these cards. In a, in a strange way, the, this sort of external threat that some of them perceive it as being a threat, though it isn't actually, is it's the only thing they have in common. A, a curious thing about the book uh, is that in a funny way, although it's only set four years ago, it's a historical novel in a weird way. I mean, um, and you know, so, so much has changed so fast particularly in terms of people's consciousness. I think that's one of the odd things that everything looks the same as it looked in 2008, but there has been this very fundamental break in the people's assumptions, I think, and almost in the texture of their lives to do with the downturn and their sense of anxiety. And, you know, the one thing, you know, in a funny way, you could, I could set the story now, except everyone's minds would be completely different. You know, their, their, their kind of their experiences and their sense of the city, their sense of their own expectation, all that, have fundamentally changed. So um, it's, a, it's a historical novel. And 2007, 2008, those things were very, very... Pro I mean, you know, it's strange how people forget, but again, um, we've lived through that before with things like the IRA. Um, my mother was Irish, and in the 70s, you were incredibly self-conscious if you had a, a thick Irish accent in Britain. And, you know, that horrors happened regularly that made Irish people um, embarrassed and fearful and self-conscious and, you know, wanting to apologise for things, but you're sort of also feeling resentful because actually it's nothing to do with them, you know. And we had an equivalent moment in the Muslim community. I don't want to put it in the past tense, quite yet, but it was a, there was a lot more of it around um, in 2007 when the book starts. And um, I, I did want to write about that because it was one of the things I felt was a sort of um, a pressure and a presence in, in the city. You know, when I was talking earlier about the kind of shift in people's consciousness, that's one of the most profound because um, someone like Roger, their whole, their sense of how they're perceived has would have shifted very fundamentally, you know. Um, uh, obliviousness is a big theme in the book. It's a thing I'm really interested in. Um, and you get obliviousness in the peak of the bubble, but you don't get obliviousness in the same way once the bubble has, has popped. And that was, that was one of the things that, you know, I couldn't now do. You, I couldn't now tell that story about characters being that, um, that kind of hidden behind their own assumptions um, and um, 
the, so the, I mean, it's interesting about him because I thought he'd be much more hated than he. I mean, it's one of the interesting things is who readers like and who they don't like. Um, and I sort of resigned myself to the fact that everyone would loathe him, even though I quite like him as a as a person. Um, and he does go on this journey. And I think the the main thing about him um, is that he's you know he's not a bad man. He's just weak, and he takes on the colouring of the world around him. You know, he's um, and in a different milieu, he'd be a different and probably better man. And you know, I think that's that's true of most of us. You know, the kind of seed that led to him, that, that character was. I remember hearing in the early years, in the early two thousands, that you know, normal looking people in the street who worked in the city in a really good year would get a bonus of a million pounds, uh, which at the time just seemed incomprehensible and bizarre. And as I started thinking about what that would what that would be like. And you know, I think what the answer to that is, you know, on Monday when you the, f the Monday you heard, or we started thinking about a million quid, it would be the most astounding thing that had ever happened, you know, inconceivable. By about Wednesday, it would start to seem normal, and you kind of start in your head, you'd have started to have spent some of the money, and you'd be planning. And by about Friday, you'd, you'd you'd convince yourself that you deserve, you know, not only do you deserve it, actually, you slightly need the money. And Roger's that person, you know, he's in one sense. He's psychotic, his frame of reference of thinking he needs his million quid. And on the other hand, for him, it's not because it's, you know, it's just become, in that world, it's become normal. Um, but the reason I think people find it possible to empathise with him is that, you know, he, he, the, that whole, the character for me began with the idea of, I wonder what it's like to be you. And if you start with that, if you start from that place, there's quite likely always to be a thread of empathy between you and the character and between the reader and the character. Because if you start thinking about, I wonder what it's like to be you, it's hard for it to be completely hostile or, or repulsive. It occurred to me, before I began writing the book, um, I was thinking about the, the things that you think about writing now, the point of view, narrative, and what the what the characters can know and what you can know and how you tell the story and all that sort of things. And it suddenly occurred to me that if I'd been writing in about 1850, I'd have had more freedom. I'd have had, you know, fewer sense of what the rules were and what I could and couldn't do. And I'd have had, you know, more permission to do what the hell I wanted. And that was a curious thought that, um, that actually someone writing 150 years ago would have had, we think of ourselves as being more permissive and more liberal, but actually in a funny way that I, I had the sense of there being more rules and more constraints. So I did in consciously choose to have complete carte blanche in terms of knowing what I wanted to about the characters, being omniscient, going into their heads, out of their heads, um, you know, being able to talk directly to the reader if I wanted, anything like that. Um, and that was a very kind of energising and, and helpful thing. It was, and it was also quite interesting in terms of the thing, the, you know, the permissions, as it were, I wrote myself a chit from Matron, but the ones I didn't then use, which was quite interesting. You know, to, and particularly the Victorian novel's trait of leaving people kind of sum, summed up forever. And quite often in the Victorian novel, it ends with the character, they're like butterflies on a pin, they're kind of fixed, morally determined, you know, sum, summed up final verdict is attacked. And I, didn't, I don't like that about Victorian fiction. It seems to me to be not true of exper to experience. I've always preferred works of art that leave that feeling that the characters are still there, you know, they're ha still having their own life. And, you know, that's where the camera moves on, but the thing is still continuing. Uh, so I didn't want that. And, and the th permission to talk directly to the reader, to sort of sermonise at the reader, was also another one I found myself not, you know, another chit I didn't use. Have, it's really interesting the different sense people have of how positive or not positive the ending and the tone of it is. Um, I, you know, I really have had uh, a kind of unsummarizably wide range of things about people saying it's dark, it's light, it's optimistic, it's not. 